In recent videos, I've talked about the possibility of uh, climate change being the factor that, in fact, drove humans into caves. And it seems to me we were taught the opposite, that humans evolved and sort of like lived in caves for great lengths of time, having not the technology to construct homes or whatever. And so they lived in caves in order to survive until they progressively evolved into more intelligent uh, species so that the, then they could go forth and create homes for themselves on the surface and, you know, uh, plant, plant and harvest and all that other good stuff and hunt. At first, they were just hunter-gatherers, right? Well, all those concepts that we were given, this is the reverse of it that in fact we were uh, already advanced human beings already advanced species whether they're whichever version you might call neanderthal or regular human you know you know i'm not going to get into all the scientific terminology of it just <clears throat> but this is the concept that in fact they were driven into the caves by climate change i'm going to talk about some things that are going to be like of course they're going to the majority of materials that are available online about this topic are going to talk about human, the human causes of climate change in the past. They're going to focus on that. That's not my focus, but you know, it could it could be legit. I'm not saying it's not, but it seems to me that the climate change comes uh, on a regular basis, and it happens every so many thousands of years. It can vary, but uh, during these times, it might be that the only way for humans to survive was to go underground. So, <clears throat> I looked up this information, Humans Driven into Caves by Climate Change, and here's one of the articles that I pulled up. Now, Could Humans Live Underground to Survive Climate Change? By Felicity Nelson, August 21st, 2023. August 21st is an interesting date. within the seven years that began on August 21st, 2017. Felicity Nelson. Okay. July 2023 might go down in history as the moment when humanity finally grasped the horrific consequences of our fossil fuel addiction. As we prepare to live in a scalding world with increasingly extreme weather events, it might be time to consider adaptations such as underground living. Surrounded by masses of rock and soil that absorb and hold heat, temperatures can remain far more stable without need to rely on energy-intensive air conditioning or heating. Not only is it possible to live a life below, people and animals have been living comfortably underground throughout history. But is it a viable solution for dealing with an emerging climate crisis? White Man in a Hole <clears throat> the opal mining town Cooper Pedy in South Australia. In the opal mining town Cooper Pedy in South Australia, 60% of the population capitalizes on this effect by living underground. The name Cooper Pedy comes from an Aboriginal phrase, Koopa Piti, Koopa Piti, which means white man in a hole. <laughs> Perfect. Right? <laughs> White man in a hole. Kuba Piti. Piti is another word for fire, I understand. In any case, the white man in a hole. Throughout, through the sizzling 52 degrees Celsius or 126 degree Fahrenheit summers and the freezing 2 degrees Celsius, 36 degree Fahrenheit winters, their dugouts stay at consistent temperature of 23 degrees Celsius or 73 degrees Fahrenheit. That is almost perfect temperature, to be honest, in my opinion. Now, without this natural rock shelter, summertime air conditioning would be prohibitively expensive. Above ground, the summer heat can cause birds to fall out of the sky and electronics to fry. But below the ground, many residents have quite luxurious setups with cozy lounge rooms, swimming pools, and as much space as they care to carve out. 
The homes must be at least 2.5 meters below the surface to prevent the roof collapsing. <clears throat> Despite this regulation, cave-ins do happen occasionally. In the 1960s and 70s, locals cut ho holes in the ground <clears throat> using pickaxes and explosives. Today, though, they use industrial excavation tools, although the work is sometimes still done by hand. Cutting out large chunks of rock doesn't take very long as the sandstone and siltstone is so soft that it can be scratched away with a pen knife. Sometimes home renovations even pull a profit. One man found an opal worth 1.5 million in the U.S. 980,000 when installing a shower. Every so often people will accidentally burrow into their neighbor's home. But in general, going underground maximizes privacy. Now, this, this harkens to the lost city of Darienku. Darienku. <clears throat> Here are some mounds of dirt next to abandoned mining shafts in Kuber Pedi. Some of these have been transformed into underground homes. The lost city of Darienku. In 1963, an unnamed Turkian man took a sledgehammer to his basement wall during a renovation of his Cappadocian home, finding his chickens kept disappearing through the hole. He investigated further and discovered a vast maze of underground tunnels. He had found the lost city of Derinkuyu. Built as early as 2000 BC, the 18-story tunnel network reaches 76 meters below the surface with 15,000 shafts to bring light and ventilation to the labyrinth of churches, stables, warehouses, and homes, which were constructed to house as many as 20,000 people. That was in as early as 2000 BCE. Wow. It's thought that Darren Kuyu was used almost continuously for thousands of years as a shelter during wartime, but it was abandoned abruptly in the 20s, following the genocide and forcible expulsion of Greek Orthodox Christians from that country. <clears throat> While Cappadocia's outdoor temperatures swing between 0 degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit in winter and 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit in summer, the underground city temperature remains a cool 13 degrees Celsius or 55 degrees Fahrenheit. 1355. Hmm, those are pertinent numbers to our current times. <clears throat> this makes it perfect for preserving fruit and vegetables. <clears throat> Today, some of the tunnels are used to store crates of pears, potatoes, lemons, oranges, apples, cabbages, and cauliflower. Just like Cooper Peaty, the rock is malleable and there is little moisture in the soil, which makes tunnel construction straightforward. Refuge or hell. While most people are willing to go underground for brief periods of time, the idea of living underground permanently is much harder for people to tolerate. The underworld is synonymous with death in many cultures. Being underground in confined spaces can trigger claustrophobia and fears of poor ventilation and cave ins. <clears throat> we do not belong there. Biologically, physiologically, our bodies are just not designed for life underground. Will Hunt, the author of Underground, A Human History of Worlds Beneath Our Feet, told Live Science. Humans who live underground for too long without exposure to daylight can sleep for up to 30 hours at a time. Disruptions to their circadian rhythms can cause a range of health problems. Another risk in underground living is flash flooding, which is of particular concern, as climate change promises to bring more extreme weather events like hurricanes. People experiencing homelessness have drowned on several occasions in the tunnels beneath Las Vegas. These tunnels are inhabited by around 1,500 people and are built to carry storm water. They can fill with water within minutes, leaving people no time to evacuate. Most of those tunnels in New York City have been cleared out at this point, but there are still vestiges of people living down there. Subterranean construction usually requires heavier, pricier materials that can withstand the pressures underground. These forces must 
also be measured through extensive geological surveys before excavations can begin. The temperature underground is also affected by what's happening above the ground. A study of the Chicago Loop Business District found that temperatures have climbed dramatically since the 1950s as more heat generating infrastructure has been built in the same area, such as parking stations, trains, and basements. For underground environments to be acceptable to people, they must be safe and secure. They must have some natural light, good ventilation, and provide a sense of connection with the world above. Montreal's 20-mile-long underground city, called Reso, embodies this ideal. The complex connects buildings so that people can avoid the sub-zero temperatures outside. The space has a mix of offices, retail, hotels, and schools, that blend seamlessly with the above-ground environment. Montreal. This city is called Reso. Climate change has already made some parts of Iran, Pakistan, and India dangerously hot. If the planet continues to boil, maybe we will consider building earth scrapers instead of skyscrapers. So there's some really good points here, don't you think? Let's look at this Reso. Have any human societies ever lived underground? From ancient catacombs to modern subways, humans have always traveled underground for brief periods of time. And have, but have entire societies of people? Have entire societies of people ever lived underground? Yes, but historically only during emergencies. So that's what I was getting at when they were driven underground and when they have had no other option. In recent decades, however, that has begun to change. The thing that is important to know about the underground is that we do not belong there biologically. We've already heard this quote per, um, who is it, Will Hunt. We do not belong there. Our bodies are not designed for life underground. Yet there are moments when we have retreated underground. People throughout history have temporarily lived below the surface for various reasons. If there were no materials to build houses with, they dug subterranean homes. Hunt told Live Science, In places with extreme climates, people went beneath the earth in the summer to stay cool, and in the winter to stay warm. Underground was also a safe place to hide from enemies. For example, ancient peoples built the famous underground cities of Cappadocia in what is now Turkey for protection against both weather and war. They were geographically in a very strategic place, Hunt said. They were constantly being attacked. The inhabitants retreated below ground during emergencies, but they didn't stay there for long periods of time, perhaps, perhaps only weeks at a time. One of the largest underground cities in Cappadocia is Darren Kuyu which dates to around the 7th or the 8th century and could have housed about 20,000 people, according to Atlas Obscura. Geophysicists have found that another recently discovered city in the region spans 5 million square feet, or 460,000 square meters, and may be 371 feet, or 113 meters deep, according to National Geographic. If this tr is true, it would make the recently found Cappadocia city about a third larger than Darren Kuyu. The underground cities of Cappadocia are an architectural marvel, Hunt said. Wells plunged deep into the water table. Holes leading up to the surface acted as ventilation shafts, layers of protection including large, circular stones that the ancient people rolled in front of entrances to the city, separated those inside from the outside from invaders on the surface. This room, cut out of the porous rock tufa, is in the underground city of K. Makil in the Cappadocia region of Turkey. Image credit John Elk via Getty Images. Not all subterranean dwellings were as complex as those in Cappadocia, however. People also lived in natural and human-made caves, Hunt noted. 
Constructed caverns can be found anywhere with the right kind of geology. For example, stone hills made from tuff, a soft volcanic rock that's easy to dig into. They're very common, he said, if you find people making cave dwellings all over the world. Even in modern-day Australia, in the town of Cooper Pedy, which we just discussed, about half of the population live in these dugouts, or holes carved into the sides of hills, according to the Smithsonian. Many marginalized people have found shelter below the surface in abandoned infrastructure of our modern cities. There are fewer of these mole people of New York than there were in the 1980s, but perhaps more than a thousand unhoused people live in tunnels beneath the streets of the city, Hunt said. Many homeless people also live in tunnels beneath Las Vegas. And large communities of orphans live under the streets in Bucharest, Romania. As more people move to these cities, more of those city dwellers may move underground. Places such as Singapore are exploring options for building downward. The technology needed to do so is already here, says Un He Lee, an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Nottingham's Malaysia campus who studies the psychology of being underground. The challenge is convincing people to move underground. In reality, <clears throat> being beneath the earth hasn't yet been shown to cause negative psychological effects as long as lighting, room size, ceiling height, and other physical attributes of the setting are consistent with above ground, Lee said. For example, technology such as light wells, which allow natural sunlight to brighten underground spaces using materials such as reflective paint, could fight depression that arises from the lack of sunlight. People may feel isolated from their counterparts on the surface, and they may feel a lack of control, but these feelings are manageable, Lee said. However, people still dislike the idea of living below ground as a general rule. In any case, Lee thinks people worldwide will start to make the move before long, inspired by places that are paving the way such as Reso, an underground city in Montreal, Canada, that is more than 20 miles long and includes shopping malls, offices, hotels, and schools. Realistically, we will go underground soon. Within at least 30 years, there are going to be more underground work environments, more underground fun places, she said. It's coming. It's not just an idea. So... Yeah, is this one of the reasons we see Montreal, Canada featured so strongly when it comes to the uh, the I Pet Goat videos done by Heliophant? There seems to be such a strong emphasis on the climate change in everything we're seeing now, including, like, for example, uh, the coronavirus itself, the whether it's a ritual, as I contend, whatever it may be, <clears throat> has to do with the sun, the corona of the sun, right? Now, there's a strong, there's a strong possibility that the changes, the climate change is a result from changes in our poles, you know, a polar shift. Now, I've talked about this in the past, and I can pull up something about this, but I just want to... Uh, stated that the shifting of the poles happens every so often as an evidenced is evidenced in history in the ice rings at the arctic and uh, also in uh, trees the rings of trees and we can see that there were increased radiation of uv light at certain points in time in history and during this time it could very well be the sun itself which forces people to go below ground. So not only temperature, but exposure to uh, more radiation, increased radiation from the sun than we're typically able to handle. And that could force that increase in uh, UV light could force people below the surface of the earth. And that may have been what happened in the past as well. Now, you know, this is only conjecture, but it's been, it's been uh, asserted by many others in, the stud in studying these things. For example, 
if we look at um, pole shift, just in general, it's a geomagnetic, geomagnetic reversal. A change in the planet's magnetic field for the positions of magnetic north and south. With geo geographic north and south possibly interchanging places. The Earth's field has, off, has alternated between these periods of normal polarity and shifting polarity. They call it a polar wander. So in a geomagnetic, rever geomagnetic reversal, a change in the, in the planet's magnetic field, such as the positions of magnetic north and magnetic south, can be interchanged. Even if they're not fully interchanged, it can be a temporary thing. Something along the lines of what most people think of as a reset. The last major geomagnetic reversal was thought to have recur occurred around 780,000 years ago. And plenty of scientists suggest we're well overdue for a similar event. However, no, the update on this is that there, are, there is new information showing that it happened much, it has happened much more often and far more recently than uh, we've been told. So, um, yeah, and of course you're going to have cataclysmic pole shift hypothesis. And uh, let's see if I can find one that tells us here about the tree, the rings of the trees. I believe this is one of them that I looked at previously. Yes, this is the article. So this was from February 18th, 2021. An ancient, well-preserved tree that was alive the last time the Earth's magnetic poles flipped has helped scientists pin down more precise timing of the event, which occurred about 42,000 years ago. So I think it's time for an update here. It's definitely time for an update on some of these. Uh, I mean, we're looking at these as hypotheses, obviously, because... You know, it depends on your interpretation, but this ancient well-preserved tree was seemingly somehow alive during the last time the, the Earth's magnetic poles flipped. This new information has led them to link the flipping of the poles to key moments in prehistoric record, such as the sudden appearance of cave art and the mysterious extinction of large mammals and the Neanderthals. So this speaks directly to this topic. They argue the weakening of the Earth's magnetic field would have briefly transformed the world by altering the climate and allowing far more ultraviolet light to, to pour in. This provocative analysis in the Journal of Science is sure to get researchers talking. Until now, scientists have mostly assumed that the magnetic field reversals didn't matter much for life on Earth. Although some geologists have noted the die-offs of large mammals seem to occur in periods when the Earth's magnetic field was weak. The, the Earth is a giant magnet because its core is solid iron and swirling around it is an ocean of molten metal. This churning creates a huge magnetic field, one that wraps around the planet and protects it from charged cosmic rays coming in from outer space. Sometimes, for reasons scientists do not fully understand, the magnetic field becomes unstable and north and south poles can flip. The last major reversal, though it may have been short-lived, happened around 42,000 years ago. This reversal is now called the Las Champ, Las Champ excursion, after lava flows in France that contain bits of iron that are basically pointing the wrong way. The volcanic activity back then during the flip produced this distinctive iron signature. As the molten lava cooled and locked the iron into place, iron molecules embedded in sediments around the world also captured a record of this magnetic wobble which unfolded over about a thousand years. Even though it was short, the North Pole wandered across North America, right out toward New York, actually, and then back again toward Oregon. Out to New York and back again to Oregon. I have showed previously imagery that shows that that's how sort of the pattern we're shown in our current eclipses over uh, North America, right? 
And this was quote a quote by Alan Cooper, an evolutionary biologist with Blue Sky Genetics and the South Australian Museum. It explains that then zoomed it the uh, pole then zoomed down through the Pacific really quickly to Antarctica and hung out there for about 400 years before shooting back up through the Indian Ocean to the North Pole once again. So a temporary pole shift, just enough for a reset, just enough to uh, eliminate a large percentage of life on Earth. These changes were accompanied by a weakening in our magnetic field, he says, to as low as about 6% of current field strength today. He and colleague Chris Turney, an earth scientist at the University of New South Wales, found a new way to study the exact timing of all this using these unusual trees in New Zealand, the giant kauri trees. The giant kauri trees can live for thousands of years and end up well-preserved within bogs. The trees themselves are quite unique, says Cooper. <clears throat> They're a time capsule in a way that you don't really get anywhere else in the world. And as I mentioned previously, bogs are an excellent method of preservation and the oldest, some of the oldest bodies we have found that are still intact for human bodies were preserved within bogs, within peat bogs. Cashel Man of Ireland is one of these. <clears throat> Take a look at bog bodies if you're interested in this topic. Inside these trees that lived during the last magnetic flip that were preserved within the bogs, these researchers and their colleagues, look, colleagues looked for a form of carbon that could be created when cosmic rays hit the upper atmosphere. <clears throat> More of these rays come in when the magnetic field is weak, so the levels of this carbon go up. So all this talk about carbon, carbon, carbon in our atmosphere and the fact that our eclipse marker for the crossing, the X over the central United States is Carbondale, Illinois. Consider that symbolic, if you will. The trees with their calendar-like sets of rings took in this specific type of carbon and they laid it down into the wood. That allowed the researchers to see exactly when the levels rose and peaked and then fell off again. One tree in particular had a 1,700-year record that spanned this period of the greatest changes. By creating a precise timeline, the research team was able to compare the magnetic field's weakening to other well-established timelines in the archaeological and climate records. <clears throat> we really think there's actually quite considerable impacts going on here, says Cooper. They also turned to advanced climate modeling to try to understand how the magnetic changes would have affected conditions on the planet. The ozone layer in particular would have taken a beating. <clears throat> if you damage the ozone layer, as we found out, you change the way in which the sun's heat actually impacts the Earth, says Cooper. And as soon as you start doing that, you change the weather patterns because wind direction and heating goes AWOL all over the place. If the sun went through one of its periodically conniptions, when the strength of the Earth's magnetic field was turned way down, he says, <clears throat> a solar flare or storm would have sent a burst of radiation that could have had massive consequences for the people living back then. This is what we think actually drove them into the caves, says Cooper. You would not want to be outside during daylight hours. He admits that it's difficult to draw clear links among these various events at this stage, but I think that's always true when you're putting forward such a radical new theory. He notes that the idea of an asteroid killing off the dinosaurs once seemed far-fetched as well. So we have all of this imaged in our current at our current time with the series of 70 um, the 7-year series of 3 eclipses over North America. And it seems to come to some sort of a massive conclusion on April 8th. Definitely within the month of April, I would say. I'll show you some other, uh, some of my other uh, personal theories on that momentarily. But uh, other researchers here 
say they're really struck by the fact that the scientists were able to construct such detailed records by the, of the timing of magnetic changes by looking at these trees. That high-resolution temporal record is pretty impressive, I think, says Brad Singer, geologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison who studies the history of Earth's magnetic field, but was not part of the research team. This is only a small number of specimens that they measured, but the results look fairly reproducible in the different trees. <clears throat> and I think that's pretty impressive, a pretty impressive set of data. He thinks this report will steer people's attention to do work that could test this proposal, that reversals of Earth's magnetic field could disturb its life. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, that was what I wanted to uh, point you to. And, you know, I ha there's more about this, the symbol symbology, in my opinion, of our uh, current... Um, set of eclipses here and although it sounds you know it's going to sound like a stretch to many people to say something that sounds so crazy but i want to emphasize that the oldest cave art like uh, all this underground stuff i spoke of uh, the the oldest cave art of humans seems to often have been of taurus the bull now <clears throat> the Lascaux Caves in France contain some of the oldest known cave paintings, dating back approximately 17,000 years. These remarkable artworks depict a variety of subjects, including animals and celestial objects. Among them, there are depictions that resemble the Taurus constellation. So even though we say here 17,000 years, over here we heard 42,000 years, and pre previous to that we heard over 700,000 years. So many different theories, right? But consider this. These Lascaux caves in France and among the remarkable artworks depicted a variety of subjects, including animals and celestial objects. Among them, there are depictions that resemble the Taurus constellation. In the Hall of the Bulls, one of the sections within the Lascaux caves, researchers have interpreted the paintings as representing the Pleiades star cluster, and the Taurus constellation. The Taurus constellation, also known as the Bull of Heaven, has been recognized in these ancient artworks, showcasing its significance even in prehistoric times. <clears throat> now we should all be aware that the brightest star in Taurus is Aldebaran, which means the Eye of the Bull in Arabic. Aldebaran is an enormous red giant star shining with a distinctly orange hue. It marks the eye of the bull. While the rest of the bull's head is delineated by a V-shaped collection of stars known as the Hyades, the connection between this constellation and the bull is fascinating, bridging ancient art and celestial observations. The fascinating story of the Lascaux Caves, I'm not going to go into because this is getting too long, but I want to point you to the symbol that is often depicted within these caves of the bull. There are many horned animals specifically depicted in the caves, but the chief and Tor is uh, the chief of them is, from what I see, is Taurus constellation, the bull of heaven. Now, when we talk about these things, cave paintings and caves and having to go underground during, due to climate change. Um, <clears throat> here's some of the imagery. I wanted to uh, bring our attention to Taurus within astrology and within, and of course, the constellation Taurus. I'm just going to start with this really short one about Taurus and astrology. Taurus is, uh, in the ancient Greek, Tauros, Latin for bull. It is the second astrological sign in the modern zodiac. The second. Now, it's interesting because April, the month of Taurus, uh, the, the first deacon of Taurus is April the 21st. So for those of you who know astrology, you'll be aware of this. Now, of course, this is, uh, this is Western astrology. I'm talking about tropical astrology. 
But it's interesting that it's the second constellation. The, sec the second astrological sign is Taurus was, in fact, April. And April was, in fact, the second month originally before they added, before they made changes to our, uh, to our calendar systems with the addition of uh, January and February and everything they did. It once was considered the second month. So <clears throat> it went from two to four. Right? Now it's the fourth month. Hmm. The addition of, again, the addition of January and February into our calendar. So, Taurus spans from 30 to 60 degrees of the zodiac, and the sign belongs to the earth element or the triplicity, as well as a fixed modality. So when you think of Earth, you should think of uh, there are three Earth elements within astrotheology. So there is a triplicity of Earth, okay, represented right in the zodiac. Triplicity of Earth. So you've got Taurus, and you've got uh, let's see, what are all the Earth signs? I know Taurus and uh, Capricorn. That, that's the two that I'm most familiar with. Let's see here. Um, I'll just continue reading and then I'll focus on that as soon as I'm done with this, okay? The, uh, the quality or quadruplicity. A quadruplicity. You remember that old movie Multiplicity with Michael Keaton? I know it wasn't a very good film. But it has something to do here. To me, this triplicity has something to do with this Venus-ruled sign. The moon is in its exaltation here at three degrees. The sun transits this sign from approximately April the 20th until May the 20th in Western astrology. So April the 21st being uh, the first considered the first deacon of Taurus. Now, I've talked many times about April, the significance of the comet Pons Brooks coming to the Earth, and it reaches its, near, its nearest point on April the 21st, which April 20 and 21st, depending where you live upon the Earth, you're going to have the same date, okay? And April 20, we know that's the 420 day, and there are many uh, 420 day rituals of importance attached to that day. We've been shown this in various ways. I've talked about them in the past. But uh, this is the uh, April 21st, as I also have mentioned many times, was the birthday, that would be the 98th birthday this year of Queen Elizabeth. And April 21st is the date of the founding of Rome. So this April 20 and 21st, these two dates, which are essentially the same day, ultimately, because depending on what part of the earth you're on, Right? So from this period, from April 20th until May 20th in tropical astrology, Taurus is one of the three Earth signs alongside with Capricorn and Virgo. So it's uh, Taurus, Capricorn, and Virgo. The three Earth deities, which are the triplicate, the triplicity of Earth, which are generally considered feminine because Earth is considered a feminine deity. Okay, just like Virgo is considered feminine. We don't often think of the bull, Taurus, as feminine, but it is always imaged as feminine when you see the lingam and the yoni of India, often shown as a lingam across a short span away from the image of a cow. Often the cow herself is horned, <clears throat> so she's the bull of heaven, you see. And that represents the divine feminine principle. So the triplicate divine feminine principle. Now we see this at the beginning of the I Pet Goat video where the goat is in the box. The goat's head emerges from a black hole in the box and we see it begin to spin around as though hypnotized. And if you take a look at that, you will distinctly see three goats imaged there. It becomes a triplicity. Okay, and the bull and the goat, and even the rabbit, are all being imaged at this time in this Taurus image. 
it, they're all being imaged with this Taurus. This is also the Donnie Darko rabbit. It is all one and the same. So it could be the head of the goat, as we see depicted in the shape of our eclipse in the Aleph, right? And I guess what I'm getting at with all this is showing how those who entered the caves tended to depict this. Why did they choose to depict the bull of heaven so often? Could this have been the sign that in fact originally drove them into the caves? As we saw in the uh, fearful imagery given to us within the film Donnie Darko itself, that's why I referenced it, you see the sag-eared rabbit or the bull. They are one and the same in my opinion. So I've wanted to talk about this for a while and I'm, I guess I'm finally getting an opportunity to do so here. And uh, so to segue, as I said, the, the April 21st is Taurus, the first deacon of Taurus. Now April, it represents to my mind the entire eclipse itself. The image we see of the eclipse markers over the United States Let's see if I can just pull it up real quick. The Aleph over America. You can clearly see the A here, right? You can see the Aleph. Now the Aleph, as we know, as we should know, the Phoenician Aleph was always based upon the, the head of a bull. It is literally the bull's head. That's what it represents. That's what the letter A itself is based on. This Phoenician A, before we turned it upright and just called it the A and eliminated the uh, its relationship, but it's not truly eliminated. This is the history of the relationship of our current alphabet, alphabet letter A. So alpha, the first and the last, perhaps. That's what it seems to be represented as in the Aleph. Now, there are different ways of drawing the LF, but this is where we are here, as it says right here. This is where we are right now. And to me, the A is April. To me, the A is Apple. April's Apple. And if you look at the uh, iPet Goat video, you'll see April with her Apple. Here's April with her apple. Here's the goat that becomes triplicate, as I explained. Avril, apple. Apple is her the representation they're showing us here, but April, represented by the Easter bunny. You see the bunny right on top of her head, representing for us Taurus. Exactly they were representing in Donnie Darko. And of course, Donnie Darko gave us a countdown timer, a timer to the end of the world, as we were told. So could this timer of the end of the world, in fact, be referring to the pole shift that is thought to appear, perhaps, and this is my theory, perhaps it is thought to have appeared in the time of Taurus. Why else should we have such deep reverence for Taurus Reverence that is based in fearful uh, imagery. If you see Taurus represented as a Donnie Darko character, that's pretty creepy, isn't it? And what about the eye of the Donnie Darko character? Have any of you noticed the eye of the bull, the red eye of the bull, Taurus, and its imagery within our dollar bill, the eye at the top of the pyramid? One eye showing here prominently on the rabbit here. One eye pointing, it's being pointed to us. And if you look at the Donnie Darko images, I mean, this is well known and well established. It's just that I personally have never talked about it. I don't know who may have. This is the image of the Taurus. Why does he have this one eye being stabbed and glowing like a jewel? and uh, swollen that we see in many of the images. And that's what was shown with our character, Donnie Darko, looking in the mirror 
and then stabbing the mirror, and it seems to affect the eye, the eye of the rabbit. The rabbit of death, it seems to be, doesn't it? So this, in my, uh, I, I am saying that I think this is, is purely representative of Aldebaran, the red star in Taurus. Now these red stars between Taurus and, uh, if you look at Taurus, let's see if I can find find it once again. I've opened so many tabs. But there is a Taurus right there. There is an image of Taurus over the, the North American continent. All right? It's as simple as that, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not, uh, I wish I could say something that would uh, alleviate any kind of tensions or fears, but I can't because there's probably a very good reason that we're being shown fearful imagery. Perhaps these people surviving in caves were uh, trying to tell us what drove them down there, right? What's the, what are they talking about here? It's thought they're talking about stars and constellations here. They're not just drawing pictures. They're not just drawing childish pictures of a cow they saw or a bull they saw or horses that they saw. These things are representing shamanic astrology. All right? And Aldebaran and the High Eighties and the Pleiades are all being shown here in the Hall of the Bulls. So um, I need to wrap this up, but just briefly, uh, Taurus astrology, I've already talked about its connection to Scorpio. Now, so there's a connection between the red star, the red eye of the bull, Aldebaran, and the red eye within the heart, or what you would call the heart of Scorpio which is Antares, Antares, often thought of as the, uh, both of these signs, to be right honest with you, Scorpio is a water sign, Taurus is an earth sign. As I had previously mentioned, Scorpio is like this child of Taurus who came first and she's the feminine, so her child, all right? But he is thought to be like the vengeance of uh, the bull. So his these two being together are often seen as the most powerful constellations. Put it like that. The history of Taurus is associated with several myths and the bull worship that we saw in ancient biblical times that where there was the uh, golden worshiping of the golden calf or images of a bull. And that was forbidden by the worshipers of Ares. To put it simply, those who worshiped the Lamb of God, those who worshiped uh, the Yahweh character, were, were forbidden to go back and worship the bull, we were told. They were told they're enemies. Although they're direct neighbors, we were told that they were enemies. And so, in other words, in an ancient time, the rule had shifted from Taurus to Aries. Okay, that's one way of looking at this. And at that, when that new age came, the old worship was forbidden. So that was a big part of that uh, mythology, the biblical mythology of the destruction or the killing of those who worshipped the bull. Okay? Anyway, uh, Taurus was the first sign of the, the Zodiac which was established among the Mesopotamians who called it the Great Bull of Heaven as it was the constellation through which the sun rose on the vernal equinox during that time period. That is the early Bronze Age from about 4000 BC to 1700 BC. Earth is the element associated with Taurus and alongside Virgo and Capricorn forms the earth triplicity. So, the Romans gave this month the Latin name Aprilis, 
The traditional etymology is from the verb apirir, to open, to open the mouth. And I've talked in the past about the mouth ritual that was symbolized on April 20 last year with the opening of the mouth ritual and the uh, SpaceX launch of the rocket during the day of the uh, solar eclipse while it was happening in the southern hemisphere over Exmouth, Australia, a rocket was launched and detonated over Boca Chica, Texas, connecting the two. I don't pretend to understand every detail of, the, of these rituals, but I definitely see that there was a ritual that happened. And all rituals pertaining to rust are connected to this because we're talking about the ancient rustic calendar, the rustic Roman calendar. And rust itself is based in iron. And as we just talked about, iron, iron is the basis of the polar shift or polar wander. The iron, the molten iron at the Earth's core affecting our magnetism on this sphere. So this ap apire to open in allusion to its being the season when the trees and flowers begin to open, which is supported by comparison with the modern Greek use of anixi, opening for spring. Since some of the Roman myths were named in honor of divinities and April and as April was sacred to the goddess Venus, her veneralia being held on the first day of April. It's been suggested that Aprilis was originally her month, Aprilis, Abierto, Aprilis, from her equivalent Greek goddess name Aphrodite, Aphros, from the Etruscan name Apru. Jacob Grimm suggests the name of a hypothetical god or hero, Aper, or Apris. What about Apus? April was the second month of the earliest Roman calendar, as I already mentioned, before Januarius and Februarius were added by King Numa Pompilius in 700 BC. It became the fourth month of the calendar year, the year when 12 months are displayed in order, during the time of the Decemvirs, about 450 BC, when it was 29 days long. The 30th day was added back during the reform of the calendar undertaken by Julius Caesar in the mid-40s BC, which produced the Julian calendar. The Anglo-Saxons called April Easter Monap. The Venerable Betty says in the Reckoning of Time that the month Easter is the root of the word Easter. He further states that the month was named after a goddess, Ishtar, Iostre, whose feast was in that month. It is also attested by Einhard in his work Vita Caroli Magni. Now St. George's Day is the 23rd of this month, and St. Mark's Eve, with its superstition of the ghosts of those who are doomed to die within the year, will be seen to pass into the church, and it falls on the 24th of April. So this has a strong connection to the Day of the Dead, and we see that imagery within the pet goat video by Heliophant. In China, the symbolic plowing of the earth by the emperor and the princes of the blood took place in their third month, which frequently corresponded to April. In Finnish, April is hutiku, meaning slash and burn, moon. When the gymnosperms were beat, and burn clearing of farmland were felled. In Slovene, the most established traditional name uh, is Mali Traven, meaning the month when the plants start growing. Mali Traven, strange name because Mal is bad. Mal is a word for evil. It was written in 1466 in the Skovsha Loka manuscript. The month Aprilis originally had 30 days. Numa Pompilius made it 29 day, days long, and then finally Julius Caesar's, and we have so many correspondences between the story of the mythology of Julius Caesar, the Caesarian one, 
the correspondences between the J.C., Julius Caesar, and J.C., Jesus Christ, are truly overwhelming if you really spend some time looking at them. The calendar reform of Caesar's calendar made it 30 days long once again, which was not changed in the calendar revision of Augustus Caesar in 8 B.C. In ancient Rome, the festival of Cerealia was held for seven days, mid to late April. Feriae Latinae was also held in April, with the date varying. Other ancient Roman observances, including Veneralia, April the 1st, Megalesia, April 10th to 16th, which I have talked about repeatedly in regards to Donald Trump and the MAGA movement and its connection to Megalesia, which I never hear anyone speak of or echo, and they should be, because it's true. If you look at these dates between April 16th and 10th and take a look at some of the stuff that is involved about those topics that I just mentioned, you will find a lot of connections for Dissidia is also included in this. So the rustic Roman calendar never truly went away. It's only ignored or overlooked, but it didn't go away and it is still celebrated by those in power. And also, of course, Perilia, the birth date of Queen Elizabeth II, the date of the founding of Rome. Okay, all of these are sacrifice dates. The Vinalia Urbana, the Robigalia. Who is Robigo? Who is Robigus? The god of rust, the god of the rustic Roman festivities. That's who Robigus was considered to be, the god of the fields. Something along the lines to the way I think of Cain from the story of Cain and Abel. And of course you have, that was April the 25th. You should read about Robigus, Robigo, and Robigalia. Serapia, April the 25th. Look in your farmer's almanacs to learn about the Menologia Rustica. Take a look to see, okay? You'll find many clues and hidden secrets there. And, of course, the Flower Festival of Floralia, April 27th and April 28th on the Julian calendar. This was in honor of the goddess Flora held on the 27th or the 28th of April. The festival included the Ludi Florae, the Games of Flora, which lasted for six days under the empire. <clears throat> so these all lasted through the end of April and into May until May 3rd. The dates differ when it comes to the Gregorian calendar. That's why you need to look at all of the calendars. We really do need to open up our minds to looking at multiple calendars. The Lyriads meteor shower. We have listened to the sheer number. Consider the ending of the pet goat video and how it clearly depicts uh, perhaps what I think is a meteor shower or uh, meteorites hitting the pyramids at the end which would represent the muddy river there at the location of the crossing and the concept of little Egypt, right? And then we see, uh, we see shooting stars coming down and hitting various points on the map at the end of the pet goat video. Consider the number of meteor showers we're going to talk about in April. The Lyrids, April 16th to the 26th. <clears throat> the, uh, the peak all around April 22nd. How close is that to our date of April 2021? 20, the Eta Aquarids. Look at how they've symbolized the Eta Aquarids in the image for us, like the checkerboard or the chessboard. That was kind of them as we are thoughtfully approaching. We are thought to be entering into the time of Aquarius. The Eta Aquarids meteor shower also appears in April, from April 21st to May 20th each year. The Pi, the Pupids, which appear in April 23rd, but only in years around the parent comet's perihelion date. The Virginids also shower at various dates in April. There are many major and minor meteor shower streams that occur during the Virginid complex. The Virgin, dressed in white, sitting on the checkerboard. The days of April, this is the conclusion of my video now. The days of April... The Journées d'Avril is a name assigned in French history to a series of insurrection at Lyons, Paris, and, other, and elsewhere 
against the government of Louis Philippe in 1834, which led to violent repressive measures and a famous trial known as the Process d'Avril. What I want to say here is that the, the days of April, the journeys d'Avril, the journeys d'Avril, d'Avril, do you remember, have you heard of d'Avril? Have you heard of d'Avril? Have you heard of devil? It is, what do you see when you look at the Taurus sign? What do we see here? What are we being shown when we talk about the, uh, the bunny and the moon? We're being shown references to the devil. Okay, that's, that's what they're saying. I'm not saying that it's the truth. I'm simply saying that's what the imagery that they're representing. Okay? If you look at that video, I can't show the video, but if you look at the Killing Moon video, the official video, and you watch closely as you listen to the Killing Moon from the opening of the Donnie Darko film, but watch the video which shows the band, and it shows it clearly shows uh, images of a of a man in red standing over in a red robe, and they're trying to represent this as the devil. So we're clearly trying to show the eye of Aldebaran as the devil. And they do the same thing with the eye of Antares or the heart of Antares and Scorpio. The ruler, Scorpio, thought to be the ruler of Hades. So, of course, they're going to image it as the devil. All right. And the red of the star always leads to these concepts. So, so we have the virgin. And we're told by all the Christian communities that, that the dragon, Satan, is waiting to consume the child as soon as it is born from the virgin in Virgo, right? We've all heard that. We've all heard that. So could it be that there are elements of truth throughout all of these different types of interpretations? Elements of truth, okay? That doesn't mean they're exactly right, but they certainly have elements of truth embedded in them, all right? So... Finally, uh, so I wanted to say that I think April has to do with that concept of devil. Now, it could be simply when you throw the devil horns at someone or you throw up your two fingers at the concert in the sign of the devil horns, we, we are often thought to think that that is the devil sign. But in fact, it is the sign of Taurus, the bull. Okay? That's what it is. But you can re-image the bull as any horned animal. So it could be an ox, it can be a goat, could even be a sheep, a big horned sheep, although the horns look different. But in my opinion, it is the straight horned or the slightly curved horns, like we would see on that of a rabbit or a bull or a goat. So April's birthstone just so happens to be um uh, a girl's best friend, the diamond. The birth flower is the common daisy, which we saw in the pet goat video on the on the head of the death character when he appeared and put his diamond ringed hand on the shoulder of the young woman standing in front of the tanks at the point of the uh, eclipse. The April birthstone is the diamond. April is the diamond. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. All the things that we were shown about, uh, let's say, Marilyn Monroe and her singing of that song and with a red background, showing clearly that she's, it's a reference to a type of a uh, something devilish, like the city of sin, Las Vegas. Something what we would normally consider anti-Christian anti values. Right, and uh, <clears throat> the common daisy symbolizing death for the most part, Bellis perennius, the sweet pea, is often shown as death because when you say when someone dies, we would say they're pushing up daisies, or when, uh, when, uh, oh, what was his name? Uh, well, there was a scene in Tombstone where, uh, the primary one of the, the main killer in that 
film, Doc Holliday, that's who it was. Doc Holliday shoots his nemesis in the forehead and he says, you're no Daisy, he repeats over and over. You're no Daisy, Johnny Ringo. Do you recall that? A ring. Johnny Ringo. Hmm. Yeah. You're no deaf, Johnny. You're not deaf, Johnny Ringo. Maybe it sounds to me like he was saying. But in uh, the iPad video, the iPad Go video, we're shown that death is her husband, aren't we? So we seem to be shown that death as though that were perhaps something along the lines of what I think of as her child of Scorpio. It's, it's really, it's, you know, the, the symbols are not easy to analyze, but they are definitely there. And I invite everyone to give your own analysis and try to see what you see here. You can use this as a starting ground if you haven't already begun this. Hopefully you'll do that. I'd love to hear back from you and hear some of your thoughts on this. Um, yeah. And so I guess that's all I have to say for this date. Uh, today is uh, the 25th. And um, I guess I will leave off with that. Thank you for listening and thanks for staying with me, folks. Take care.